So welcome to the SIM Online Masterclass Series Season 4. I'm Stephanie from the Local Engagement Team, and I'll be the host for today. The topic for today is driving consumer demand using data. So I hope you're excited to hear what we have in um, store for you. But before we officially begin, please do take note that this session will be recorded and we'll be uploading the recording on our YouTube channel so you can check it out later as well or you can share it with your friends if you think it's beneficial for them. So this will actually be uploaded about one week after the session ends and also just another general, um, gentle reminder that if you do have any questions along the way, just feel free to type them in the chat below and we'll be able to assist you accordingly. And there will also be a short briefing right after the masterclass um, to share with you more about the graduate diploma in business analytics program from a few of our colleagues as well. So let me introduce the speakers for today. So the first session where it is a masterclass, we have Mr. Koei Boon, and then continue um, by our program briefing, which will be led by Ms. Lanston and also Mr. Vino Chia. So to share you a little bit more detail about our speaker for the masterclass, uh, Mr. Koei Boon is actually our our head of program for the, um, the IIT diploma and um, also our foundation studies at Singapore Institute of Management. And apart from that, he is also an experienced software developer with more than a decade of industry experience. We will actually gain a Bachelor of Science in Computing and Information Science of Information System from University of London, and also a Master of Engineering in Social Media and Urban Analytics from Nanyang Technology called University Singapore. As a software developer and course consultant, on the other hand, he has also delivered creative software solutions across a range of industries such as education, smart cities, social media, and FMB as well. So without further ado, let me pass the time over to Mr. Koei Boon to start the session. Over to you. Thank you. Hi, thank you, Stephanie. All right. Good evening to each and every one of you. All right, thank you uh, for joining us tonight. Okay, so tonight I'll be sharing uh, one of the interesting topics, uh, not just in business analytics, but in data analytics and data mining as well. Right, so what I'm going to share with you here is, okay, um, I want you guys to actually think about, you know, uh, your shopping habits, right? Your shopping habits. Online shopping habits, okay, particularly online shopping habits, how, you know, sometimes when you shop for something, right, and then perhaps you will get recommended, right, some products that you might not have even thought about before, right? So taking this idea here, right, what actually resulted in this, right? What actually resulted in this? So, Think about this, okay? We live in a world, right? Where everything is actually connected by data, right? It's actually all connected by data. So when you talk about, let's say, okay, we talk about Shopee, right? We talk about uh, Lazada, we talk about Coupet, we talk about Amazon, right? Whenever you make a transaction or whenever you actually visit a product web page, that is actually data, data generated. Right? And we live in an era whereby, well, if I may, we can't live without data anymore. Right? Whether we like it or not, data is here to stay with us. So, you know, back in the 1960s, people always wondered about intelligence. Whether is it possible to make machines that display intelligence? Right? And if you think about it right now, do the machines that interact with you today display intelligence? Right? Okay, we don't need to go too far. Okay, we just talk about your iPhone, we talk about your Android phone, right? So you have in your iPhone, okay, your C, okay, is that an intelligent? Or is that an intelligent form? Right? So back in, you know, back in the days, 1960s, or even as early as World War II. Right, people were already thinking, is it possible to have automatic machines? Machines that obey human commands. Okay, and in order for this machine to do that, we need data. Right, we need data. 
in the current era, fast forward to 2020, all the machines around us, okay, your smartphone, even your TV, your fridge, all consume and actually generate data. Okay, and by doing so, they display some form of intelligence. Right? They display some form of intelligence. So we live in a world connected by data and perhaps powered by artificial intelligence. All right? So that brings us to the question. Do you really buy what you need? Right? We talk about the basic survival instincts or the basic survival needs. What do you need? Food, shelter, water, okay, and perhaps clothing. Other than that, do you need any more to survive? Right? Okay, perhaps not. But yet, we tend to buy things that, you know, is actually recommended by online commerce platform. Right? Or sometimes, you know, when we go Facebook, Instagram, or even Twitter, okay, and you get show some ads, right? That it might be related to what you have been doing, okay, on the internet. So for example, okay, let's see, on the internet, right? Perhaps you are shopping for sunglasses, right? Sunglasses. And then for some reason, okay, when you visit your Facebook, okay, or even your Instagram, Okay, and you get show ads that's related to sunglasses. And perhaps, okay, to even go further, you get show ads that's related to a beach vacation. Right? So, how, how did this happen? How did this all happen? Okay, again, data. Okay, because whatever you do online, right, all these generates data. Your Google search, your purchases, okay, and all this data, yes, they could be gathered by different vendors, okay, but they eventually will actually end up to a single repository or a central database in words, right? And that causes us to actually buy things that sometimes we don't really need. Okay, and that's today's topic, okay? We are driving consumer demand using data, right? We are driving consumer data so consumer demand using data. So if you think about it, okay, some of you might have seen this before. Okay, we live in an era where every now and then you keep hearing the word big data, or rather the two words big data. Right? And this big data, they have some form of characteristic, right? That actually distinguish it itself from other form. Or rather, this personality or this characteristic are why that it is called a big data. Okay, we talk about, of course, when you talk about big, we talk about volume, right? Okay, it's always volume. So volume, why? Because lots of data is being collected. Okay, and as I mentioned earlier, okay, when you do anything online, this generates data. When you shop, when you do a Google search, when you watch a YouTube video, they all generate data. Okay, and these create a huge amount of data on a daily basis. And to make the challenge even, you know, even more and more difficult for people to handle this data is the velocity that it comes in. It's coming in at, two, at a very, very fast pace. Right? A very, very fast pace. And not only that, you're also expecting different kinds of data coming in. Right? So when you shop, that's one data. When you watch a video, that's another data. When you do a Google search, that's another data. Okay, and this big data also presents challenges okay, for data analysts or people who are dealing with business analytics. Right? Because you have so much data at hand, and the question comes now is, how do you make sense of it? Right? And then, of course, you know, some of you might be aware okay, about the PDPA in Singapore, right? We are becoming more and more concerned with how people handle our data, right? We want to maintain privacy. So 
you know, if you back to the question earlier, you know, driving consumer demand as you know, using data. So, you know, they're using data to push products to us, right? They're using data to push products to us, right? Then the question is, are they able to preserve the privacy of this data? Are we able to still remain anonymous on the internet, right? So when you talk about, you know, how this e-commerce platform actually recommend products to you, is the idea of automated learning. And this could not be done without the idea of data mining and data analytics, right? So automated learning is already here. Some of you might have already seen in our current era, okay, when we talk about self-driving cars, okay, and when we talk about drones, right? So drones has many useful capabilities, right? Then you might be thinking, okay, maybe some of you might have read, drones could be used for military purposes, okay, for scouting enemy territories. But what about for the commercial aspect? What about for the commercial aspects? Drones could be used for delivery, right? Drones could be used for delivery, right? So not too long ago, okay, actually Singapore is exploring this idea of using drone delivery. But what was the issue? What was the limitation that actually stopped or rather halted the development of drone delivery? It's the idea of airspace. Right, and the idea of privacy as well. Okay, because if you start having drones that can do delivery, so imagine, right, let's say you live in a, in a multi story apartment, okay, and then you have your delivery delivered to you, uh, you know, on the rooftop, perhaps. Or if, let's say, you know, you have a balcony and then the drone actually come and deliver it at your balcony. Right, so the concern here is what if, you know, the drones will install, you know, they install some sort of camera on these drones and then therefore they are able to actually scout the whole area, right, where you live. Okay, of course that causes privacy issue, right? And so there's a limitation to the height limit okay, on which these drones can fly. But, you know, if you're living in Singapore long enough, you know that we have many high-rise buildings and if you limit the height, at which these drones fly around, then there might be a risk that these drones will crash into some of these buildings, right? And also to self-driving cars. Now, the question now is, do we have sufficient data to support both of these applications, self-driving cars and drones? Okay, the answer to you will be yes. Sufficient data. So what went wrong? Why can't we roll them out yet? You know, roll them out yet, meaning, in public, okay, widely used by the public. Okay, so for self-driving cars, what's lacking is actually the learning, the learning part of this machine. So this machine needs to learn the cultures of human behaviors, how cars drive on the road and how humans behave on the road. Okay, so what we are lacking here is actually the learning process. And learning takes time. Okay, so we have plenty of data, right? We have plenty of data, but we are not having sufficient learning for the machines yet, All right? So data is used everywhere, right? It's used everywhere. So how do they drive the demand, All right? So you imagine, okay, you watch a video, on you know uh, uh, delivering drone right delivering your purchase right at your doorstep or at your balcony so that makes you wonder you know that could be something exciting right that could be something exciting that and that could perhaps also drive you to purchase something you know just to try out this drone delivery system right so not just for drone delivery not just for for self driving cars we have seen data used in medical, healthcare, right? In the hospitality sector, and even in grocery shopping, right? So imagine, okay, 
which earlier I've mentioned, everything now is smart, right? You have the smart fridge, the smartphone, right? Even you have smart light, smart window, smart blinds, everything is smart, right? So imagine one day, you don't even need to step foot to the supermarket to actually purchase your grocery, right? Because the fridge does the shopping for you, right? So the fridge will know that, oh, it's time to top up your milk. It's time to top up your eggs, right? And then so it automatically sends an order to your nearest supermarket and get them delivered to your doorstep, All right? You might be thinking, you know, is this real? Okay, and of course it's real. <laughs> Okay, otherwise, I wouldn't be able to use it as an example here. Right? So smart grocery shopping, yes, it's real. Okay, so imagine you have a concept, you know, a smart kitchen concept, right? And you have this fridge that is connected to the supermarket website, okay, or supermarket platform. And then, so you tell your fridge, okay, so I have my eggs here. Okay, I have my eggs here. And then you tell your fridge, all right, so if my eggs runs out on this shelf, please replenish them. Okay, and it does. Okay, so the fridge will then send this order, right, to the supermarket. And the supermarket packs all the eggs and whatever groceries that you're lacking, and then get them delivered to your doorstep. Okay, but of course, we are not talking about, you know, can this be trusted, you know? What if the fridge orders something that you don't really need, right? Perhaps you still have eggs around, okay, but and the fridge made the mistake, right? So, you know, perhaps there's still eggs, but then there's something wrong with the system and then the eggs still get delivered to your house and then you now find yourself having too many eggs, right? Can that happen? Yes, it can happen, right? So back to the question again, is it because we are short of data? <laughs> no, we are not short of data. We have plenty of data. And again, the question comes back again is, Right, the machines are not trained well enough. Right, the machines are not trained well enough. So, you know, as a data analyst or you know, someone, you know, the data specialist, what is their role then? Right? Their role is to ensure okay, these devices they receive the appropriate data, and in the long run, these devices will be able to learn from this data and be smarter than they are now. Okay, it's not that they are not smart now, it's just that they could be smarter. Right? So, back to the question, yes, we collected all this data, and then now we are short of, you know, the training period for the machines. That also raised another question. The digital footprint. So, what is the digital footprint, essentially? Right? You know, just like, you know, when you, your, your own fingerprint, right? When your own fingerprint, when you touch something, right? Let's say a phone, you know, or, or an object, and you leave your fingerprint, right? Essentially, you do that, right? So earlier, okay, when I mentioned that you shop online, you do a search, you watch a video, and these generate data. Okay, and this data can one day be pointed back at you, right? That is also another area for data mining, data analytics, and business analytics, right? It's how, right? How can we actually gather data from you without identifying you? So let's say, let's say, okay, let's say I'm a business analyst or let's say I'm a data analyst. I collect data from each and every one of you, right? But at the end of the day, when I receive this piece of data, it will not be able to link me back to you. Are we able to do that? Okay, then the question is, if, if it doesn't link back to you, right? If it doesn't link back to you, then essentially, you're not giving any value at here, right? Okay, because as consumer, you will want some kind of value-adding service. You want to, to get some marketing materials that is you know, something that you're interested in and something that you would buy. So if I can't identify you, how would I forward you the appropriate marketing materials? Right? This is also another area to explore. And it's also an area that is right now uh, a very trending area. Okay? Because how can we keep a record of a person without 
invading the person's privacy, right? And, you know, people should be held accountable, right? People should be held accountable for the data they generate online. Why? Uh? What's the reason, right? So, for example, right, you go online, you know, if you serve Facebook, you know, you watch YouTube video, those are fine. Nothing wrong there. But what happens if, let's say, you download um, media that infringe some sort of copyright, or maybe you post video that does not belong to you, and then you post those video on YouTube, and you start getting a lot of subscribers, and then you get paid for it. Right, that's copyright infringement, right? So, if you were to, you know, mask off who generated this data, who created this data, then there's no accountability, right? We can't find the people who actually plagiarize others' work, right? So there's a lot of challenges here. It's a very interesting challenge as well. And it's a reason why it's, still, it's a trending uh, kind of a career right now, right? Digital footprint and maintaining the privacy of data. So, back to the part about, you know, driving consumer demand, okay? So, to, in order for this driving consumer demand and for, you know, for the machines to learn about you, right, to serve you, we have this problem of corporate surveillance. So, what is corporate surveillance, right? Basically, you have all these big organizations, right? They come up with these devices, your iPhone, your Android phone, Samsung, okay, whatever brands. They come up with all these devices and they want these devices to serve you the best that they can, right? So how can they achieve that? Okay, so they achieve that by collecting data about you, right? Same for Facebook, same for Twitter, same for Instagram, right? They collect data about you and then they try to do something that makes you feel more satisfied with their product, okay? And that's the idea of consumer profiling. So consumer profiling in, in current context actually goes one step further. So they're just not dealing with just a single platform data that you have. They are dealing with multiple platforms of data that you generated across the web, right? So they will be able to link your Facebook account with your Instagram account, of course, with your Twitter account, and whatever account that you've created online, they will be able to link them all together. And once they link them all together, okay, so you, you imagine they have one big chunk of data right now, okay? Link them all together, they will be able to use this data and push products to you, market products to you, okay? And in their consumer profile, okay, they will have things like your financial capability, Okay, whether you're a student, you know, whether you're a working adult, if you're a working adult, okay, you know, how well off you are, are you earning a lot per month, right? Okay, so if let's say, okay, let's say, okay, one of you, you know, you're earning 10,000 per, per month, okay, so you're financially well off, okay, and they'll start pushing you products, okay, that is, or maybe luxury products, okay, that may, you may be interested and you are able to purchase them. Right, so you know, corporate surveillance. Okay, it's not something that we really see here in Singapore per se, but it's happening. Okay, it's happening, and even if you see it in Singapore, you know, rarely corporate will actually announce to the public that hey, you know, I'm surveilling my customer actually. <laughs> right. Okay, but yes, it's happening. So, can data be collected anonymously? Actually, the answer is yes. Okay, there's many ways that data can be collected anonymously, right? So, you know, one, one approach that Singapore has took, of course, you know, in, in, more, in current context is, is not um, common, you know, for, for commercial uh, settings to actually get your uh, national ID number, your NRIC. Okay, rather, they will actually use your mobile number. So, only under essential circumstances, Okay, really, really essential circumstances. Like, if I, if I don't have your national ID, I can't do the work that you ask, right? In those cases, then yes, they will be asking for your IC number, right? But other than that, okay, if you go to the shopping mall, you sign up for some sort of membership, some lo loyalty program, 
Okay, they will only be using your mobile number, right? The accounter staff at least. Okay, maybe, maybe when you register for the membership, yes, okay, you need to register your IC number to identify who you are, maybe to identify your age as well. Okay, but other than that, okay, you'll be dealing mostly with mobile number. Right? So then you must be asking, so is data mining really that dangerous? Right? Is data mining, data analytics, and business analytics really that dangerous? Right? Actually, it depends on who's using it. Right? It depends on who's using it. So we as human, right? We as data analysts, right, or data specialists, we should be careful how we handle data. Right? And then, so, so the question now is, is there, you know, is there a, a career in data analytics then? <laughs> Definitely. Okay. The career in data analytics, business analytics, and data mining, okay, in the current era, okay, is a trending career. Right? And it's actually projected to go even further. Okay, it's projected to actually go even further. So, you know, just take Shopee for example. Do they need data analysts? Sure, they do. What do they need data analysts for? I mean, they are already earning, you know, a lot from all the, you know, shopping spree, you know, the monthly sales, right? So why do they still need data analysts then? So have you ever wondered how these shopping sales were actually organized, right? So what is the mentality for human being? All right? Mentality for human being is, you know, if you see that you know, it's a sale day, you tend to have a, a, a kind of like a, like a buying urge, you know, an urge to buy something. Right? It's, it's, it's common in, in human beings, right? I mean, for most human beings, like, okay, I would say for most, because maybe some human beings, they prefer not to shop. Okay, but for most human beings, okay, when you see, oh, today is a sale, right? And you start buying things, right? You start buying things. So the question now is, are you buying what you need? Are you buying the essentials? Or sometimes, okay, you're actually tempted to buy something that you don't really need. Okay, perhaps a new branded wallet, perhaps a new sunglass, right? Do you actually need them? And then another question that comes in is, right, do items, uh, or rather, are items really less costly than they are before the sale? <laughs> right? This is the question in mind. Right? Actually, a lot of times, okay, whatever you see on Shopee, you see on Amazon, you see on Lazada, okay, there's many, many products that's actually more expensive than they are in the sales period than before or after the sales period. Right? So, that's they're, they're kind of using data, all right, to kind of create like a like a like a buying urge for you, and then to create the image in your head that oh, it's actually cheaper, you know, you know, you're on sale right now. We are on sale right now, so you better buy now or you miss the sale, right, right, or or, or rather the the urge of urgency. Okay, and of course, you know, in Singapore, of course, we we'll talk about the fear of losing out, right, <laughs> right, or fear of missing out. For more, right? So they, they create this kind of a psychological uh, ideal on you, okay, and therefore driving you to actually purchase from them. Okay, so that's what the job is data analyst. Okay, so whether is it a data analyst or you know a business analyst, you know, some of you might be asking here, so what's the difference? You know, you have you know Shopee is data analyst, and then you have GovTech here, which is a business analyst. So you know, what's the difference, right? So data analyst, analysts, okay, more often you'll be dealing with literally the hardcore part of, you know, coming up with information from raw data, from raw data. So <laughs> if, you, if you remember from our earlier uh, big data slide, right, you have the volume, velocity, and everything, right? So as a data analyst, you'll be dealing with those. Okay, huge chunk of data, you know, where you can't make any sense out of it yet until you investigate. So those are data analysts. So what about for business analysts? So business analysts actually earn slightly more. 
Okay, because they need to look at the data from a different perspective. They need to actually take a step further in a long-term planning kind of a manner. So business analysts don't really necessarily deal with the raw data. Okay, although in their job scope, they could have done that. Okay, so in the job scope, they could have actually touched on the raw data. But essentially, their role right, is to look at, in the long term, okay, with the same piece of data, can I predict in the long term what will happen next? Right? Can I make decision in the long term right, based on the data that I have at hand? Okay, so they're thinking in a broader aspect, in a higher level aspect as compared to the data analysis, right? And the slide here that I've shown is actually the starting pay, right? The starting pay, listen carefully. It's the starting pay of a fresh graduate entering the job market, right? So for our graduate diploma and our graduate certificate, okay, it's not really targeted at fresh graduates, right? Per se. Rather, okay, so although fresh graduate, you can come in, yes. But, you know, thinking, like, if, if you are a working adult, you have been working in the industry for quite some time. Okay, and then you decide to, let's go, like, look at, look at data in, in a different perspective. Okay, if you decide to do that, okay, or if perhaps you're attracted by the salary here, okay, I don't know. Okay, whichever the case, right? Let's say you are a working adult and you're looking for a career switch. Right, and you decide, oh, let's switch to data on business analytics. Okay, you might be looking at whatever that you have here, maybe a 10 or 20% more than that. Because it's in, in high demand. All right. So, you know, two years ago, if we look at data analytics, uh, data analysts and business analysts, the salary were not that high. Okay, pre COVID. Okay, for data analysts, Okay, Pre-COVID, you're looking at around 3.9, perhaps even 3.5. And then for business analysts, you're not looking at 6K. You're actually looking at maybe 4 and 5K. Right? So, you know, the, the increase in the salary range over the past two to three years is largely attributed to the need of such talent. Okay? Because not only myself, Okay, the government, they know okay, that whatever topics that I've mentioned earlier, they are coming. Right? They are coming. Okay, you have self-driving cars, drones, okay, and also how can we protect our data? Okay, whether we like it or not, these are trends that will come eventually. Inevitable. inevitable. Okay? So, actually with that, Okay, I have ended my presentation. Okay, so I hope that you have enjoyed the topics in business analytics and data analytics. Right. And now I'll pass the time back to Stephanie. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing um all the insightful sharings and also the trendings. And hopefully. Maybe down the road, we will see all this happening. So yeah, uh, for the participants, be able to answer them accordingly. But while everyone is typing in the chat, sorry, I think I was lagging a little bit. But let me just repeat for you. So, okay, so I think uh, just now I was sharing about the quipping out their questions. We'll now quickly hand over the time to Bino and Nance as well for a quick briefing on the graduate diploma in business analytics program available in SIM. So I'll now pass my time to Bino. You can share your screen over here. Thank you. Okay, hi, uh, I'll be briefly going through uh, the graduate programs that we offer in SIM. Uh, Okay, for the GDB and the GCBA. Okay, over here, I'll be talking about the admission criteria and progression, and then the program structure, and then I'll hand over the time to Lance to talk about uh, the unique details of the program, and then we'll end off the Q&A session. Okay, so basically for the admissions into the GCBA or GDBA program, okay, you'll basically need a degree from a recognized university, uh, or 
if you are actually a diploma holder with at least uh, eight years of working experience and 30 years old and above. Okay, so English wise, academic qualifications, uh, yeah, you yeah, have to get the medium uh, and IL 6.0 equivalent. So basically, after the completion of the GDBA program, okay, you can actually progress further to uh, the Master of Science programs that's offered by the University of Warwick. Uh, you have to meet their English requirements, of course. And then uh, the other option was uh, is to actually progress into the Master of Management program uh, that is offered by SUSS. Okay, uh, this is uh, you need to meet the requirement as well admission requirement, and then you're actually, after completion of the GDBA program, you'll be entitled to 10 units of, uh, 10 credit units, okay, exemption. Okay, moving forward, uh, okay, basically, the GDBA program has, uh, and the GCBA program has three intakes per year, uh, January, May, and September. So basically, two modules will be offered every term. Uh, the hours of uh, the teaching, the teaching hours will be uh, from 7 to 10 p.m. Uh, it'll be normally conducted on when Monday and Wednesdays. Okay. And then you'll need to cover a total teach uh, hours of uh, 234 for the GD program and 117 for the GC program. So all the modules are actually conducted by local lecturers. And for our GD program, you'll need to complete uh, six modules and GC program, three modules. Then for each module, they'll have like 13 lessons and the current mode of, uh, the current mode of con uh, lesson presentation is actually via blended learning. So seven lessons will actually be conducted on SIM and six lessons will be conducted online, okay? So there is actually examinable and non-examinable modules for each of the, uh, for, each of the programs are. So the breakdown is shown, okay? Module fee per module is actually 963. So the program to complete, I mean, to complete a certain program for GD, you'll, you'll add up to around $5,778. And then for GCBA, uh, for the graduate cert programs, around $2,889. Okay, moving forward, uh, yeah. As mentioned earlier, the test and retest, uh, it depends on which module you're taking for the particular term. So tests will be normally conducted uh, at the end of the second month. Okay. And then, yeah, 7 to, 10, uh, 7 to 9 p.m. And for exams, they will be conducted close to the end of the third month. Same thing, 7 to 9 p.m. Okay. So yeah, as you can see the breakdown as mentioned earlier. Okay. So this is the grading criteria that we have for our programs. So basically, uh, you need to pass up the relevant modules to be able to get award. I mean, to be able to be awarded uh, for the GED and the GC, uh, the, yeah, to graduate and get, yeah, the, the cert and the diploma. Okay, moving forward, I'll pass my time to Lens. He'll be talking more on the unique selling point of the program. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Bino. Um, thank you for joining us. Uh, good evening to all you guys. Uh, my name is Lance Tan. I'm the uh, academic in charge for the graduate certificate and graduate diploma in business analytics and also the graduate diploma in digital marketing. I hope you have gained much uh, knowledge from our expert speaker and my colleague, Mr. Koei Boon. So if you are hoping to learn more about data mining, I'll be telling you just about a bit, all right? Um, in the next remaining minutes, I hope to just give you a brief outlook on what, this, uh, what the programs are all about in terms of the graduate certificate and graduate diploma in business analytics and also the graduate diploma in digital marketing. Uh, but before that, let me tell you about a survey uh, that was conducted by Accenture. It was published on the Straits Times in March 2020. Uh, it was reported that 84% of employees surveyed are overwhelmed or unhappy with working uh, with data. Half of them uh, took sick leave uh, due to the stress. Uh, Singapore is ranked number two in that uh, poll and India topped the list. So we kind of understand how you guys feel when you work with data. Uh, 
majority of us. Uh, so to, to avoid this, the 40% right, actually would find alternative method to complete the task without using data at all. Uh, so frightened about data. So I'm not sure how you feel about, uh, about this, uh, but this is surely an area where skills are required and opportunities abound, right? So the GD programs that I'm telling you about, they're designed for executives and managers to advance their skills in these areas. So let me introduce to you first the Graduate Certificate in Business Analytics. Uh, in short, we call it a GCBA program. If I keep repeating it, it's just really a mouthful. So it helps managers to understand the emergence of business analytics and the use of data for customer acquisition, retention, and revenue management for their organizations. So in the GCBA program, students will receive knowledge through classroom learning and as well as hands-on practice in the following modules. Uh, Bino, can I have the next slide? Okay, so you can see on uh, the GC, okay, on the left column, you can see uh, graduate cert business analytics, and then the center is graduate dip business analytics, and then on the right side is graduate dip in digital marketing. So in the GCBA program, uh, there are three modules, which is uh, which are the customer relationship management and then the business analytics concepts, principles, and applications. And then um, final one, the data mining for managers. So it is done in this way. Uh, as the table is drawn in this way. Hope it's not too confusing. But it is also the common module with the uh, GDBA and the GDDM. So sorry for the acros because it's just too much to say. So what I'm saying is that this GCPA program uh, is the kind of the foundation and also a common module between the, the three programs. Okay, so for the students who hope to delve deeper, the GDBA program, the Graduate Diploma in Business Analytics, provides an excellent avenue to further the manager's analytical skills. Students shall be exposed uh, to the software like Python, uh, R, and Tableau. The students shall learn to effectively communicate the findings of the analysis by data visualization techniques. So in this uh, program, the modules taught are Python for data analysis, predictive modeling, and data visualization. That's the center column that you're looking at in this slide. All right, and the, the final one on the right side is the data, uh, sorry, graduate diploma in digital marketing. So in this program, students uh, will be taught how to uh, use the communication um, and digital intelligence deliver value for their clients. Students shall also learn how to apply the various digital marketing strategies to different business models in reaching uh, integrated marketing objectives for the organization. This course shall also explore the use of social media platforms to gain insights to support business de decision making. So in this program, the um, three modules that will be taught uh, in addition to the three modules taught in the GCBA will be digital marketing, new media communication and management, and social media marketing. Yeah. Uh, next slide, please. We don't have, oh, okay, sorry, I'm this here already. So the, the uh, idea of the GDBA program is to give um, students the a flavor of the softwares, uh, popular software in the market. So uh, in, on this slide, you will see that the, the six modules as taught in the GDBA program. Uh, this is also, quite, some of it is common with the GDDM and also the GCBA. So for the business analytics concepts, principles and application, we'll be using Excel. So this is quite a common um, software that you guys already have. So you'll be using it getting yourself um, coming more and more like an expert in using Excel. Uh, next, we'll be using uh, Python for data, sorry, Python for Python for data analysis. Um, this is by far from what I've surveyed with the um, uh, people who are using in the market. They say Python is one of the most popular one now. Data mining for managers, we'll be using Excel for predictive modeling. Uh, we can use Python or R programming, uh, but the lecturer will be using R programming to um, demonstrate uh, the, the modeling done. 
for CRM, uh, we'll be using our programming. And for data visualization, uh, we'll be using Tableau. Again, this is very popular amongst the um, industry experts. Um, to make things easier for the students to pick up um, R, we have uh, introduced a kind of a pre-course and introduction to R programming for our students, uh, which means that before the module begins, they can actually go online and uh, watch video clips on how to how to uh, use R. There'll be hands-on exercises and, and some tutorials even for them to practice before coming to class. Uh, we're in the midst of preparing another e-module, uh, which is the introduction to uh, Python. Hopefully it will be rolled out soon, uh, so our students will benefit more. Uh, next slide. Um, I'm not going to go through um, all, uh, all the details. Bino has touched on them already. Uh, but uh, suffice to say that um, for the, the GD programs, we'll be focusing more on the banking and finance industry, the insurance, the shipping, and also the HR industry. So with, with all this, right, we can kind of apply straight away to what we are doing at work. Um, the software are usually um, uh, free um, to the students. We will help our, our students to even uh, get uh, Python. Sorry, I think Python R is okay. Tableau will seek kind of like a, a approval to get the students to try it out. Um, and there's um, in, in, our, in our modules, in our GD programs, um, it's also very flexible. There's no uh, strict prerequisites. Um, students can choose to study uh, on a module basis if they prefer. Um, so what I'm saying is that uh, you may be confused a little bit about, for example, how do you put in the GCBA program and the GDBA program together? So the, the short to this question will be that if you are doing the GC pro, GCBA program only, uh, for example, you come to class once a week on Monday. But if you're doing the GDBA program or uh, GDDM program, you will have to come to class on Monday and Wednesdays. So then again, you besides uh, instead of just three modules, you'll be doing six modules. Yeah, we can pick this up uh, after this uh, on the on the uh, Q and A. If you have any questions, uh, next slide, please. Okay, so this is what our our uh, our student, our graduate, was uh, passed out from the GDBA program. What they say about us? Maybe it take some time to read it. Uh, but in short, uh, what uh, Zach said was that the course syllabus for the GDBA programs gives me a broad flavor of what big data, business, and data analysis uh, are. So he kind of benefited from it, and he, he thinks that it helped him in his in his work, in his presentation of data, especially. Uh, next slide. And this is Max. Max says that uh, this program has enlarged his vision, and now he is able to understand about handling data, about uh, data mining and predictive modeling. Yeah, next one. Okay, so we've come to uh, the end of my briefing. Uh, yeah, with that, um, we I hope we all enjoy, I mean, I did enjoy um, listening to the overview and also more about the program itself. And I hope you all did too. And with that, we will call this session an end. And Thank you so much for spending your Thursday evening with us. And if you have any more questions or anything, you can email us or you can even call us on our hotline and we'll be more than happy to assist you. Thank you. And I hope you all have a great evening. Stay safe and take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Hope to see you guys on campus. Yes, hope to see everyone on campus too. Thank you. I'll end the session now. Have a good day, everyone.